Sifu Tim Richards, it's so good to see you again. You as well, brother. You as well. Thank I, you for setting I, this up. It's good to hear. Of course, I'm happy to, to have a chance to share your work and share the, the persona that you are with more people. I think I feel very, very lucky that I got to experience learning from you uh, for a very brief period of time last year when I moved to San Francisco and I looked up Jeet Kune Do, uh, instructors in the area, and I was surprised by the first thing that popped up, which was peace of mind, which was a, an interesting counter expectation to what you sort of expect if you're researching martial arts. So why don't we talk? We we'll start sure. there. Talk yeah. about the the name of the gym, the name of your practice, and, and go from there. Hmm. Let's see. Well, that's what we're all looking for, I believe, is to uh, to to be happy, to find that to find that place, that quietness inside. You know what I mean? To reach that that potential, our our human potential. So, I mean, uh, Jeet Kune Do at its highest level is is being in the zone and in the high. I mean, in the zone. So, the highest vibration you can vibrate at is love, and to be in a state of peace of mind and to be happy is like uh, the aspiring goal. From you know, I think all of us have so. So and, martial and arts is a is a path, a pathway, is a gateway. So my business is really about helping people um, reach their highest self, tap into their potential. You have the physical that you have to develop that allows you to break and get into the emotional and the mental aspects when your hormonal profile is working correctly for you. And then, then when you're, everything is running right, the machine is working right, you're in connection with your mind, your body then you can really tap into that higher vibration of where you're trying to be in spirit. So I think that they're all integrated into that, that, that triangle of mind, body, spirit. So and peace of I, mind I, is like the goal. It, it's, and it's a beautiful, I think, encapsulation of this bigger path that I think um, often hides behind, you know, the, the face value of martial arts. I think there's like, there's an interesting nuance there when you're, exploring the path of peace through violence right um and, and dealing with things like pain and discomfort and and the ability of you know you going through it but also subjecting other people to it um and it speaks to this deeper philosophical root behind a particular kind of practice how do you how do you fit into that how do you fit into the the, the blend of philosophy and the, the the part of violence that leads to peace to peace well like uh, the old the old adage, the old quote says, "Rather be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war," right? <laughs> and one of them always talks about uh, a program that he has, which is "Arrive before you leave." And if if you were a samurai warrior and life and death is on the line, you can't run out the door hitting the buzzer, you know, version point zero five of yourself instead of two point oh. You really gotta hit the ground running and have be in the operating. Oh, Puma. Be in the sorry about that. <laughs> be in the operating state you want to want to be in when before you leave your house when you arrive. So that arrive before you mm. leave mentality is is preparing for life. I I train for life. I want to be able to have the courage and the ability to help someone in need. Um, if uh you know if a a, a giant boulder is rolling down the hill, you want to have enough awareness and movement potential to get out of the way. You know, mm -hmm. tsunamis coming, everyone run to the hills. I mean, those are, you know, so we have to have to prepare ourselves in life not to be, you know, worried, but just to be able to adapt and blend with whatever life throws at you. So that's just preparedness, training, war. You know, I believe it's a lost, lost in a lot of today's thing, but I, I, the warrior mentality of wherever you go, someone else always has a friend, mm. wherever, wherever, wherever you're at, anyone in need, uh, I, I'm, I just butchered that, by the way. So mm -hmm. just being able to lend a hand to, uh, to another or to be prepared in life is to, to, uh, to walk with awareness and, and courage and strength. I don't know. Please, mm -hmm. I, I digress. No, no, no. But it, it's, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful sentiment, right? There, the, there's this big, like, with this power comes responsibility aspect, too. Um, and... You know, having done it myself, you know, the practices that we do sort of like put you in a state of better alignment with your own body. You know, you're moving parts of you that you totally forgot you had. Um, 
and and things of this sort. So why don't we talk about a little bit about the the practice itself and movement, maybe the the broad category that you I know you love so much. Well, mastery of self in time and space, you know, it all starts with an awareness, um, weaponizing mm -hmm. your awareness, you know, of yourself. What does gravity feel like on your body? What does it feel like to shift to the left and shift to the right? How do you move your your head offline? Some of these things, um, you know, martial arts is is a sandbox that allows you to explore, you know, and uh, the human potential. It's like it's, I like to play. Play has always been like my number one. And if you if you're not, uh, I don't want to. When you're a kid, you don't think about running. You just go into a full on sprint. You know what I mean? So. We want to still have that aliveness and flexibility and pliability. So I, I realize as we age, as we get younger, as we, um, I'm kidding, as we get older, we, uh, we want to be able to still have that freedom to move and to play. So to keep that spirit alive and to, to respect the body is, uh, is integral into, uh, for me, a lot of my happiness is tied to movement. Unfortunately, like I noticed that when I'm injury, injured, I can't walk or something's mm -hmm. going on with some body part not able to do the things you love to do. It's one of the hardest things, especially as a mover, to accept those limitations. And that's life. It's always about mm -hmm. adapting and changing what is. But, you know, I believe uh, the human body is pretty amazing. So not giving up and not uh, not saying, oh, I used to could. I used to could. But, I mean, that's still, that will happen <laughs> one day. But we uh, we give up on way too early is my point. So. And, but, and again, how about we, we put some of the listeners in sort of like, try to guide them into what this experience might feel like, you know, th think of somebody who's listening to this, who's probably, you know, works at a, at a, you know, more regular desk job, um, not moving all the time, has sort of has like very fixed routines in life, you know, Monday to Friday, you know, the typical sort of, um, San Franciscan, um, and, um, and imagine, you know, like walking into your gym and like, what are the kinds of motions that they would find themselves like doing within a few minutes of talking to you? Hmm. Learning to breathe, learning to take a deep, hmm. deep breath deep into their belly and starting there. Everything starts with the breath, but, you know, trying to, uh, when we remove certain, I like to start people with some somatic stuff of removing one of your biggest inputs is your sight. And when we take certain things away, we can now focus and hyper, uh, bring hyper awareness to some of our other senses. So like slowing things down and getting people in their bodies in the very beginning, because that's where we start. Um, but it really depends on their goals. Everyone comes to me for something different. So at Peace of Mind, my facility here in my place in San Francisco, the studio, um, I help people with their goals based off of, I meet them where they're at. So not everyone comes to me for the same thing. Mm -hmm. So as well as I would love to share Jeet Kune Do, small circle Jeet trap boxing, and some of the other arts and, and ways of moving for that part of it. It's not what everyone is seeking, you know, but at the end of the day, we want to get to know ourselves better and A, learn to move better, get out of pain. Um, mostly, a lot of times people come to me with that self-defense um, component in, intertwirled or intertwined in there. Um, but um, it really just depends. I, 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 the only reason I say that is as a, as a sitter, I just generally want people to understand that the number one fight that we have is gravity. And gravity mm -hmm. is constant. Now, here's a second squared. It's always pulling on us. And if you're sitting down, leaning forward, typing, you're sitting in a shortened position where you're, you're sitting all day long, your hamstrings, your calves, your hip flexors, they're all in a shortened position. And your body gets real good at doing whatever you put it to there's there's a saying you you become an expert you, you whatever you do or don't do every day you become an expert at so when you sit all day long your body says i'm going to get really good at this it's going to stiffen up so i want to bring people to the awareness that um you have to understand your limitations and I, that could be whatever that is some people may just have some limitation in one body part or some lack of mobility but um knowing yourself is discovering self-discovery I'm here to help you in peace at peace of mind to discover, to really delve deep into that rabbit hole of self-discovery. And martial arts is this great sandbox mm -hmm. that really helps us learn to express ourselves and test things out and play in the, in the, in the, 
in the three dimensional, four dimensional, fifth dimensional space, time, space, space, three, you know, three dimensions of space, and then mm -hmm. we have time, that other component, our, our awareness of this fourth dimensional reality of time and space blending that fifth mm -hmm. dimensional reality. So, I, I uh, by knowing our limitations, truly knowing yourself, then you can. And discovering those limitations, you can chip away at your limitations and watch your capabilities grow. And so a lot of people come to me and they don't, oh, they're not aware of what their limitations are. And I help expose mm -hmm. and show them some functional, starting with functional movement patterns, okay? You know, mm -hmm. most people sit down or wear the wrong type of shoes. And those two things, and, and they do it every day. Like I said, what you do or don't do every day, you become an expert at. But the type of shoes you wear and the sitting patterns that you do or the whatever whatever patterns you do, repetitively we always have to bring in reciprocal inhibition to the movement patterns of the body everything's based off of movement and uh, the right amount of strength and flexibility on both sides of the joint and starting with movement but that's not where i start originally as i first take this through an intake process i want to understand where this person's coming at because we have to understand who we are but what are our fears and the fears is the first place to start mm -hmm. what is causing our what is causing us to be in a state of dis-ease disease mm -hmm. or does that make you know what I'm saying? So we want to get to the root cause mm -hmm. of why are they coming to see me first? But a lot of times it can be something in the inside, the emotion, but it can also be something with the body, and those two are intertwined. So you know, mm -hmm. chipping away at the limitation, chipping away, shed it, peeling away the layers of the onion, we can discover the self, and then now we can watch your capabilities grow as we move down the path of reaching your goals. You know, mm -hmm. so really, just uh, I want to understand where people are and help them move better, help them get over understand their their tools their strengths i move a lot so i'm really going to do my best to sit still here for you but like that whole demonstration i would have been sitting and standing and talking <laughs> to you the entire time oh so yeah so for me like i said it's not always about movement stillness is one of my other uh masters and teachers has really helped shine the light on in my life as a master what is the true master strategy is to develop the ability to focus on stillness that is our superpower so Understanding all the movement happening in, happening in your universe allows you to focus on the stillness because we need to be able to quiet our mind while we are sitting, which is a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to quiet our mind as we're doing some kind of movement. And then we need to be able to quiet our mind while we're doing some type of movement, but we're responding to some type of chaos. Maybe things flying mm -hmm. at my head, maybe, you know, bricks falling from the sky. I need to be able to be... Mm -hmm connected to myself in those states, but only if we practice stillness in each of those states can we carry that over into our everyday life. Stillness and stillness, mm -hmm. stillness and stillness and movement and chaos. So again, these are some of the practices, but again, we need to discover where someone's at mm -hmm. and then drill down and then help reach those goals. But for me, it's like uh, removing fear. Fear is a, mm -hmm. and turn, using fear as a, you know, understanding what your fears are and understanding if those are real. Because if they're not real, we have projected fear and we have fear, and we need to understand those. So please. Um, no, 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 and it, and it's and it's beautiful because like I think one of the first impressions that I had was a conversation much like this when I approached for orientation, and it was this happening in three sixty. Like it, we were both sort of turning around and you were moving and you know sort of like you know showing some of the stuff and you know really you know dancing to the to the lecture. And it added this dynamism that, you know, very quickly made me realize how, you know, how little effort I had put into, you know, the mobility aspect of my life. Um, even though I had run a marathon, for instance, like it was still very one dimensional, uh, functional type of, you know, means to an end type of uh, pursuit as opposed to a more holistic, you know, practice Um and it was also interesting in the in the current context of you know the post pandemic world where the world had been so uncertain uh, for for two years and was slowly becoming a bit more normal. But you know, like there was a part of me that needed okay some sort of certainty. Um, and I mean, like there are so many branches to explore within this this theme. And I just also really enjoy when you go off on your sort of like uh, on your. Uh, revelations about how this stuff that's clearly so passionate, you're clearly so passionate about. Um, but one of the um, um, proverbs that I heard you repeat a good amount uh, in our time was the four stages of knowing, or the, the four stages of knowing something. And you were talking about getting to know your inner fears. Um, so why don't we, we explain the framework of the four levels of knowledge um, as somebody might be dealing with their fears? 
Okay, so uh, the way I was explained to me, I'll try to keep it simple and make that um, you have unknowingly unknowing. You do not know that you don't know something. So you walk by my studio, you're like, oh, what's this place? I didn't know what that was. That Jeet Kune Do piece of mine, uh, small circle, Jew trap boxing, all that's like, okay, that's weird. I didn't know. I didn't know nothing about that. And then all of a sudden, so not knowing you don't know, and then knowing you don't know, you walk into the place, you're like, oh, this place is here. Okay, wow, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff, Jeet Kune Do, uh, there's a whole bunch of things I didn't ever think about. So now knowing that you don't know, and then obviously the next stage is you practice. Say you practice for a year and you're like, oh, now I know this. I know to punch, I know to kick, I know to move my head, I know to slip. So knowingly knowing, so unknowingly unknowing, knowingly unknowing, knowingly knowing, and the last one, unknowingly knowing. So when I throw a punch at your face and you just move and you slip, you don't think about it, it responds and you move all by yourself. That's the unknowingly knowing part. And that's how we want to train. We want to train our nervous system so well that we can respond to things that happen without even thinking about it on that reflex level. So that's the unknowingly knowing is where it becomes reflex. You don't think about it. It just happens. Um, you, you know, that's so yeah, I think that. No, no, no. And, and, and no, no, that's perfect. Um, I was trying to think of like somebody who's, you know, you're, you're, you're going through this exercise with somebody who you're both going through this exercise, right? Like, so the, the initiate doesn't know obviously what the master knows, but the master wants to tune into the, the sensitivities of the initiate, right? So you're both discovering this mutual thing, the learning process together. Um, and you mentioned the, the exercise of, of, um, of uh, acknowledging your fears, right? And, and so staring at your fears and how might that look like for somebody to think about like, you know, with, with some reasonable fears that I think we all probably have, right? Like uh, fear of an untimely death or fear of, um, you know, the world going crazy again or fear that, you know, reality isn't exactly what it seems. Um, what might a journey like that look like from your perspective, obviously, you have to go through it to actually feel it as the as the initiate. Um, but how would you sort of tickle that uh, that problem? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, are we talking more of the general out of my control fears? Are we talking about still like I, I was been broken down to me like this? There's a project. I mean, real fear: a tiger chasing you, mm -hmm. a bear coming down the street, wild dogs, whatever. Um, great white sharks for me when that's why it's hard for me to get in the water when I want to surf. Um, so there's these, these in my mind, the real fears, and then there's projected fears, public speaking, things that, you know, fear of being judged, fear of not being good enough, this goes back to knowing who we are and not, you know, and the more we know ourselves and some of those fears kind of, kind of, kind of dissolve themselves and are, and, but there are obviously real fears that are out of control, but we can only focus on what we can control. And that goes back to the self and, and, and preparing ourselves to be most ready to that as we can, whether that's mm -hmm. be strong enough to hold on to a bar for a minute, because I don't want to, I always talk about if I'm driving and I we, we careen off the cliff and I'm hanging on to a bar, mm -hmm. first of all, I don't want to want to let go. But second of all, I want to know that I've trained my body that I can reach down, grab you, pull you up, pull myself over the ledge and then get help you get up. So training our mind, our body mm -hmm. to be able to adapt is, is, going to be one way that we can do a positive active thing to eliminate and to break down those barriers of our of our fears that we can control now things out of our control like the meteor hitting you know what i mean then you just have to have a good connection with yourself and your creator because if you're if, you, mm -hmm. if you're connected to your creation to yourself then you know and be present every moment because like i said this this gift for me the pandemic losing my father all these other things in my life have really helped me focus on what is most important is to be present, present right now, right here where life happens. You can't be focused on the future and have, that's where we're focusing on anxiety. You can't be focusing on the past. It's not that you can't look to the future and have goals and it's not that you can't reflect on the past so you can learn from your mistakes. But if you dwell on the past, that's where we find ourselves being depressed and, you know, uh, uh, obsessively thinking about something that's already happened or obsessively thinking mm -hmm. about things that haven't happened. All you can do is prepare yourself to adapt in the present moment and be connected to the here and now. And that's what Jeet Kune Do martial arts really give you is the ability to study yourself, to study others, to watch. And this weaponization of your awareness is the master skill in the master class. And I also just love the line. Sorry, sorry. I think the connection got, got cut you off a little. Um, but what I was just going to say, what a great line, the weaponization of your awareness. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit? 
Well, a lot of these teachings I give up to my my masters, but Sifu Singh, Harinder Sabawal, Sifu Habuhal, Sifu Singh is a Harinder Singh is a one of my teachers, and he's really uh, brought a lot of awareness to the present moment and stillness and how to activate and tap into those things. So, um, weaponization of your awareness that comes to a lot of things because I mean that's we are so distracted in today's day and age. Right, and so mm -hmm. so distracted that how can you how can you we don't want to be the thermometer where we just respond to the environment. We want to understand how to develop the awareness of ourselves, so we're more like a thermostat. So we have a thermometer in us. We are aware when the temperature is going up and when the temperature is going down, mm -hmm. but we have the master control to adjust and make that calibration to where we want to be. And then we're not just responding to the universe, but we're actually making a conscious choice to respond the way we want. And only if we have practice, awareness, and uh, uh, weaponizing our awareness at such a degree that when the, when, the, when the storm comes, that you can be like, oh, the storm is coming. I need to put my sails down, right? And it's a practice mm -hmm. because in the moment when the storm's coming and you anger rises and i'm talking about anger let's just talk about anger for instance mm -hmm. <laughs> let's say this storm is anger it could be any storm but the storm of anger is coming and if i haven't practiced oh i'm aware that i'm getting angry i'm mm -hmm. aware that i'm in then how am i going to not make a choice and just respond out of that anger i need to be able to catch myself oh i'm getting frustrated my blood temperature is going up let me take a moment let me breathe let me take a take a pause to be of that mass that stillness that master strategy is a practice and if you don't practice standing still you don't practice breathing you don't practice doing any of those things, you're, you're not going to be able to pull it off in the moment. I always tell my students, you're not going to rise to some new expectation or level of like, you saw something on TV, you're like, oh, well, uh, um, I saw that flying spin kick. I saw that guy take that <laughs> knife away. He did that. Oh, I can do that. You know what I mean? You don't just rise to some expectation of yourself. You only fall, you always fall back upon your training. So if you've never practiced mm -hmm. moving offline, you never practiced doing any of these things, it's going to be very hard to pull off. So what you can do slow, you can do fast. We do things over and over. A thousand times is just to functionalize some kind of pattern. Ten thousand times to master it, at least. At least ten thousand, mm -hmm. probably more. That makes sense to truly master it or becomes reflex. So we need to spend the time with ourselves to get to know ourselves, to prepare the mind, the body, and the spirit. And that's, again, the weaponizing of our awareness has comes down to you actually being able to be aware when you go in your brain to think. You know, when a thought mm -hmm. comes, you catch it right away. Do you know what you're thinking about? And can you have the control to to pause and put that, that break on and stop the universe? Superpower. Bam. Take a breath. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I can come to it in a different in a different place where you want to where you want to come from, you know. So that that's what mm -hmm. I think at the highest level is just having that uh that capability and that goes down to just again a, a practice. All of these things are developing a small practice of stillness, a practice of movement, a practice of strength, mm -hmm. a practice of flexibility. Sometimes you, and it could be five or 10 minutes a day. The Kaizen principle is constant improvement. I don't care if it's 0.003. Mm -hmm. If you did 0.003 every day, it's going to be constant, not consistent. Because you can be consistent for like, I was consistent for three years. I did it every day. What da, 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 da. But then all of a sudden I took four years off. And then like, so whatever, mm -hmm. right? But if you're constant, like the sun coming up every day and setting in, this, in the western sky, then that relation, that 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 exponential uh, factorial type of develop that building compounding is a uh, something. It's about lifetime. All the things mm -hmm. I want to help people with is at, adopting it as a lifetime practice, and then you will just watch your watch your capabilities and everything constantly, slowly. It's the, it's the journey, not the destination. But along that journey, it'll mm -hmm. be a great thing if you're moving in the right direction. You know? mm -hmm. so. And make it fun. Um, no, no. Not, having, not having fun. Go ahead, sir. Oh, no, no, no. I, it, it's just, it, it's exciting because I want to sort of talk about each and, all, each and every one of them. Like, I, you keep bringing up breath. And I remember you, breath is a central theme. It was breath and balance. Um, and it's one of those, these things that, like, most people don't ever think about their breathing. Like most people don't like, you know, and, and I count myself as one of them. Most of the time I'm not thinking about my breathing. And this is the thing that is literally giving me the oxygen I need to survive. Like if I don't breathe for two minutes, I'm in, in, in the worst kind of pain and I just take it for granted. Um, so why don't we unpack breath a little and then we can talk about balance because you also mentioned gravity. 
and I like talking about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I have applied physics. I wasn't big into physics in school, but now everything I do is like this applied physics. and I love it so much. <laughs> but um, uh, starting with the breath. Well, let's start with the machinery first. We're always limited by our machinery. So I've been taught that you have hardware and you have software, right? And if you're hardware, if we do, an, if you have, you have a phone, you have a computer, we're both on phones and computers right now. Good. So we understand the concept of you have hardware. And once you get a hardware update, you're probably going to need some kind of software update to match it. And we want to understand that, that framework as well. Let's start with the hardware first. The hardware is, is the, the tissues and the, the bones, the muscles, the cellular structure. But when I talk about the breath, the breathing muscle, the diaphragm and the transverse abdominal muscles that help you get full expansion into the lower lobes of your lung. That's where I like to start with people. Because if you have a weak diaphragm muscle, our bodies aren't lazy, they're efficient as heck. Okay. Our bodies are as efficient. They're the most efficient vehicle. But they, it can, it, it's, it's, that's its priority is to be efficient. Your body wants to be as good at it can, whatever it wants to do and be efficient at it. Okay. So the reason I say that is we want to make sure that your breathing muscles that we strengthen your diaphragm so i give people a couple deep breathing transverse abdominal breathing muscle exercises and bring awareness to to the muscles that it takes to to breathe when we're first we have upper chest muscles and breathing into the shallow portions of our upper lungs and then in the deep belly breathing we really access a whole different level of interaction of air exchange uh, more alveoli in the in the lower lobes help us uh, like i said take a much deeper breath um, and actually stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. Whereas if you're breathing in your chest, <laughs> you can have this almost anxious response. And we want to, oh, there's something, something just popped up on my screen. I don't know what that is, squad shot. Okay, please, something in this app just popped up. I had to delete it, so I couldn't see your face, <laughs> sorry. Um, so getting people aware of how do I have a daily practice? Even if it's, I always ask people this question and, it, and it's partly to throw them off, but I say, you know, I'll just ask you, so Chris, do you sleep? You sleep? Do you sleep laying down? I do. I do yes. 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 So do I. And I always start with that because since I know it's a, it's, it's not a trick question, but it kind of is because most people humans sleep laying down. Not saying you can't sleep sitting up. Because some people have a heck of a skill. My dad can fall asleep right in a recliner. <laughs> and now I can, I can do it. My cat sitting on me in the middle of the day. It actually happens to me now. But before I could never sleep sitting up. My point of all that is sorry. I, I digress. If you, you and I both start our day and end our evening, or end our day and start our day in the, in the lying down position, whether you're on your back or your side, you start lying down. It's a perfect opportunity in this moment to spend 30 seconds in the beginning, maybe two minutes evolving to two to five minutes, depending on and maybe a couple of times throughout your day as a way to start your breathing practice because you're already in the perfect state. You're already lying down. So when I, I could lay on the floor, but I basically have people lie down on their back and they put a small like a one pound weight, circular weight, or CD, mm -hmm. or any object right on their lower abdomen, right on their navel. And I have them focus on breathing in and trying to rise their belly up to the ceiling and, and lift that weight or that object up so they have this physical cue that they can watch rise. And then when they exhale, I want them to drop their belly. Even after they let all the air out, I mm -hmm. want them to even pull it and actually do this inward draw, even closing off the throat a little bit, the glottis, and, and doing this mm -hmm. little... Uh, reverse pressure in their stomach to pull in their abdomen. They call it Nali Kriyas in yoga to really suck mm -hmm. in. By developing these diaphragm muscles and these lower transverse abdominal muscles to be strong, when you need them, all of a sudden you get really good at deep belly breathing. Because if you don't have those muscles, your body's going to recruit. You're going to recruit muscles from the chest, the pectorals. You're going to press serratus anterior and different rib muscles that weren't, weren't really intended for breathing. But when you're you doing an exercise like swinging a racket, and you don't a uh, tennis racket or doing some activity and you don't have the correct breathing muscles working for you, your body's going to recruit for muscles that you may be using to play tennis or to swing that racket. And therefore you're going to fatigue even quicker and break down. And therefore your economy of motion and, and your athleticism, it's all interrelated. So we want ultimate efficiency and maximum performance. So understanding the breath, whether it's uh, from a performance athletic standpoint or how to not lose my wind in a, in a boxing match mm. or just to make sure that, actually tap into my my ability to relax and not be in a state of panic and anxiousness you know what i mean so the breath is such a huge uh component but starting with the hardware uh we want to strengthen your breathing muscles and get you accessing mm -hmm. those first and if those are strong then we can move into some of the other aspects of the software and uh mm -hmm. just uh 
different breath training. There's different breath work from different schools of thought, and depending on what you're working on, you can use your breath to energize you. You can also use your breath to bring you down. Mm -hmm. What's nice is your mm -hmm. heart and your breath are somatic, are, are autonomic uh, mm -hmm. uh, systems in your body that have without you thinking about it. Right now you're thinking about your breath, but if you stop thinking about it, you're going to go back to breathing, even though when you, you may think you're not going to, but you're like, oh man, I forget, now I have to think about it. No, but mm -hmm. what I say is you can control your breathing patterns and slow your breath to slow your heart rate, or you can spike up your breathing patterns and rev your breath and raise your respiratory rate and raise your heart rate. So you have both capabilities. And that's what's interesting is that we have the control to take to control over these systems that work for us automatically that are so integral and important to us, our heart and our breath. But if we have a little bit of mindfulness and awareness, we can actually change the entire paradigm of how our hormonal, how our whole system is running, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. Oh, it's so cool. And, and there's the rhythm to it too, right? Like, you know, there's, uh, as in, this is the time to get, you know, fired up. This is the time to get relaxed. So there's like a, a meta awareness of uh, not just the breath itself, but like when to engage different kinds of breath. Um, and then there was the other component, which which is is the other big fight that you know we're doing all the time that most people are oblivious to. That is gravity, right? And I remember one of the first like light bulb. There were many, but one of the first light bulb moments in our in our practice was like that in combat you want to leverage gravity as much as you as you can. It, even like when you you try and like lean your body down um, when when performing a striking motion. So why don't we talk about gravity as it relates to someone's being in, in the world? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, force equals mass times acceleration. So our, our, the amount of force we can generate is how we truly access this, this, the, our mass, our body mass. And if we're utilizing the, the perpetual energy of gravity and that, my whole goal is about energy conservation. My teacher this year turned 75 just, just, and he still moves like a cat. And he's still the softest and most fluid guy I know. And he's the baddest man I know. So my point of, of this is he's shown me that less is more and slow is fast. And by understanding how to use your, to do less by utilizing every surface of your skin, every ounce of your gravity and allowing that person to deal with that instead of using muscle, it becomes a lot less work. My goal as I get, as I get younger, I want to continue to do less. Because it's not about doing more. <laughs> All these young whippersnappers want to do more. It's about doing less. And that's what, that's what you start to learn in the martial arts. This is amazing. Uh, but you want to see how important that, that, that understanding your own balance and how gravity is constantly working. If you don't have balance, like I said, breath is number one and balance is number mm -hmm. two. If you don't, those are the most important things you can, can, can develop your intelligence around and develop that, that awareness around. Because at, at the end of the day, without those two things, you have nothing. You're, you're, you don't have your breath you're disconnected to this plane this energy with your energy body is connected from this physical plane and if you don't have your balance you 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 can't control time so and i don't usually and like when it comes to martial arts i don't think about fighting anymore it used to be about punches kicks throwing. it's not about fighting it's about understanding movement it's about how to steal time how do i blend with force using less energy to connect and disrupt balance because if i disrupt your balance in any way you don't you've lost time and that's the most important resource because in that time now i can you're not doing what you thought you were doing and then i can do other things like taking the fight away and breaking the structure down through utilizing surface area and mass and some of the simple uh simpler aspects non-violent things it's not always about punches and kicks it's about understanding how to blend with those things and take those things away so but doing less again and, and there's no, 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 it totally, totally. And it, it opened the door for something that I was hoping to talk about too, which was that feeling of losing your balance, right? Like we, most of the time we don't lose our balance, but you know, you know, if you've ever tripped or you've ever like, you know, um, lost your balance and fallen, you know how much despair that sensation causes. And it's almost like unfightable that you can't untrain that reaction in the body, uh, uh, the feeling of falling and not panicking. Right or, or like insta panicking, whatever that might be. Um, so there's this whole category of of reactive body behaviors. Balance is one of them. There's you know somebody touching your eyes, for instance. Like you can't. There are no heroes against somebody touching your eyes, um, and being able to prompt those to achieve a desired outcome. And I think that was one of the most valuable things that I found in in. Jeet Kune Do and your practice specifically was just 
switching my perspective of martial arts from striking and punching to no 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 you want to there's an economy of pain and you want to minimize the amount of energy and suffering and disruption to achieve a state of balance and you just you, which is noble in and of itself and works on so many layers um but why don't we talk about that um aspect of violence which for me was incredibly enlightening and for some people who may not necessarily identify with the prototype of a martial artist um that would make this a bit more accessible to them well it comes that that response that training your ability to be aware this is like one of my teachers he talks about combat chess Jeet Kune Do is combat chess. And at the highest level, we're playing chess in three dimensions where you're studying me, you're watching me, I'm watching you. You're what? Let me, let me go backwards. Let me, before I go there, um, our whole thing, the whole relaxation and gravity and the breath, we have to train our responses to come down. When tension hits us, when tension hits us, everything comes up. Our energy comes up. When your tense energy comes up, your heart rate comes up, your respiratory rate, your mind is racing. We need to train ourselves to relax, to not think about all this other stuff, to come down, to sit, to feel the gravity, to come into our body and to relax. Those are things that have to be trained. So that relaxation component, we'll get to the, and then I was, you were talking about reflex and training. So in this combat chest, instead of, like I said, doing more, it's about being, hmm, to train, I want to take advantage of someone's lack of responses or their over responses. And there's certain places mm. on the body that you touch that you get an automatic response. And if I know when and where you're going to be before you do, and I'm controlling your movements because I'm controlling your balance on the subtlest level, it's no longer about punches and kicks. And if the idea is to take, I, I have to control distance at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. how, there's stages of an altercation. Most things start from a far distance and there's some kind of closing and bridging of the gap. And then there's some kind of continuation or whatever. You being aware of controlling distances at the various stages and to be able to, to blend or to enter, to connect with somebody in a way that you're not. One of my teachers, he professor always tells me, um, it's more important to, to, to not get hit than to hit. So I'm not in a hurry to mm -hmm. hit, not afraid to get hit, but not in a hurry to hit either. I'm not greedy to hit. My, it's not even about hitting. Mm -hmm. It's about touch at the end of the day. It's no longer about hitting. So when someone's hell bent on trying to hit you, and instead of me going to them, what's more, what's more economy of motion or doing less than allowing me myself to play with the distance of the interchange and to connect in a way that allows me to take advantage of surface area and mass and doing less and auto responses. And if, for instance, if I elbow you, and there's a big impact that might create a lot more space. But mm -hmm. if you throw a punch in your butt in my forearm and I stretch you out and I'm connected to you, I may be able to manipulate mm -hmm. your body and your structure in a way where I don't have to hit you to create more pain compliance and more overall control over your movement patterns. And therefore, mm -hmm. when people can't hit and then they're feeling pain, they're less, you're in more of a position where you can talk to them. And it's not at the end of the day, I come at martial arts from a very Buddhist perspective, from a very compassionate. Mm -hmm. My goal is to not hurt anyone. I just don't want you trying to hurt me or hurt anyone else around mm -hmm. me. So I'm going to even stop you from hurting yourself is my point. It's not about mm -hmm. necessarily beating someone up, but being able to break down their structure in a way that a lot stops them from being a threat to themselves or anyone else. And that's a high level of martial arts. And it, it took me, I've been training martial arts since I was four and a half years old. And <laughs> it's, and, 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 and it's been my life since I've been 20. So for the last 20 some years, it's been completely fully engaged of learning and, and, and dedicating to that, that growth and that, that space. Um, in that time, I realized it took me 30 some 35 years of my life before I realized when I was um, handing, getting my ego taken away, my teacher took my ego away when I, when I was a, a young, whip, when I thought I was a young whippersnapper or speak and strength mm. battered and it was about punching and kicks and striking and all of a sudden I had a senior citizen take my uh, take my wind uh, take my ego and show me that I couldn't touch them and then all of a sudden then show me that they, I couldn't stop them from touching me and that was a whole other thing a whole psychological battle that I had to learn and mm. understand so at the end of the day defense beats offense and if you focus all your time on offense and you don't understand a lick of defense you gotta be careful when you deal with someone who spent a little bit more time playing with not hurting people but not getting hurt we're back sorry about that man i 
I just turned off my Wi-Fi. I had a call from my teacher, but I didn't answer it. But it just knocked us off the call. I don't even understand. So I apologize. And thank you, by the way. Uh, today is first day of Metro Retrograde is what my Mackenzie just told me before she left. So we're going to probably have some technical issues, just so you know. It is actually the very first day Could of Metro. I was like, really? I'm going to do that? <laughs> Could it be ahead. any more literal? <laughs> right? Seriously. It's oh, connection man. issues. So please. What, were we, what was I saying? Um, we were talking yeah. about the autonomic uh, responses and um, and you know how you might want to prepare for, but also understand how it works in the body. Well, yes, and that goes back down to what you're talking about the martial arts. So a lot of there, it's one thing technique. There's fighting strategy and there's tactics and strategy, right? Mm -hmm. um, being able to understand that. I'm not fighting you because self-defense is different than MMA is different than mm -hmm. sport tech. You know, there's tradition, there's sport and the street and the street combines all of that and throws a lot of it out the window as well. So you're going to see mm -hmm. <clears throat> that there are different ways of attacking and defending obviously in different arts. Um, Ji Kune Do, they break it down into five single direct attack or single angle angled attack attack by combination, attack by draw, hand immobilization attack, attack, and uh, progressive indirect attack, kind of from mm -hmm. fencing, where we attack on one line and all of a sudden when the person's responding, we switch to a different line and hit them in the open line. That's a progressive indirect attack as we're going forward. Um, but the hand immobilization attack coming from Ji Kune Do and originally Wing Chun and some of the other, um, some arts like to trap the hands. If I'm if I have one of my hands trapping both of your hands, I have a free hand to poke, to slap. And if I touch your face, poke you, slap you, touch you in the eye, you know, whatever, um, with my free hand, that creates another response. So my whole goal is to out-response you. It's to understand that puts you behind. Once you're behind and you're responding, you're no longer ahead. And if you've lost your balance and you're trying to respond, you're darned if you do and you're darned if you don't. My whole goal in Jeet Kune Do is by understanding hand trapping or by even Jeet Kune small circle Jew trap boxing, which I believe is at the highest level of the pagoda because it's no longer just even about intercepting, punching, and kicking. It's about intercepting, capturing, and controlling, and locking, and taking the fight away without with less punches, with less kicks. Not that the punches and kicks couldn't be added if they wanted to be, but it's about injuring uh, force continuum and doing only what you need to get the job done and not doing any more. There's no need for overkill. There's no need for excessive. Why would I make a fist when my open hand can do just the same thing and get a bigger response? So sometimes shocking the nervous system with a slap or a poke can get an automatic response. And then someone blocks and covers themselves. When you lose your balance, you don't maintain mm -hmm. a fist. You open your hands. When you're losing your balance to catch yourself or to push someone away or to you get hit, you try to cover. Even if you, even if you miss the block, if you get hit, you still put your hand up late to try to cover which all of a sudden you've given another response so if you've trained yourself to overwhelm somebody's nervous system and then to take advantage of their over responses and how to break their structure down with as little moves possible by utilizing efficiencies of your structure and your gravity and your movement patterns to not use muscle but use the structure itself and leverage and economy of motion, then it's a whole different vehicle than just thinking about trading punches and kicks. Because if, mm -hmm. it's one thing to attack somebody when they're when when they're defending. I have to go through your defense. But when you're attacking me, I've always learned the best time to disrupt somebody or to attack somebody is to do it while they're attacking. Because most mm -hmm. people, even when they're attacking, even if they're defended, they cover their shoulder, their hand is up, and they're completely defended when they attack, they have still opened up various lines or things to attack. So, mm. but by defending, someone has to go through your defense, which is a totally different animal to go through someone's defense mm. and to actually play with disrupting their attack is a totally different thing. So I much rather disrupt your attack than try to go through mm. your defense. So again, mm. my goal, again, in self-defense, I'm not trying to fight, so I don't have to attack you unless you're attacking or assaulting someone that I love or someone that's there that needs a hand and they can't protect themselves and you have to enter. You don't always have the luxury of going second, but if I have my mm. ideal choice, how I rather be caught on film and how I rather approach the situation based off of tactics and strategy and compassion and awareness is to be responding and being able to have the option to respond to you versus trying to attack you. Mm. So it gives me an advantage. The advantage goes to the counter puncher versus the puncher mm -hmm. in boxing, but go ahead. No. And there, there's two lessons there that I also remember from our classes that were, um, there's this thing that the brain does when, when, engaged in conflict that it sort of you know stands guard and is like 
it, I'm in a fight now. And so like it mistakes the objective of the fight for the fight itself. And so, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you find yourself wanting to be in the performative punching and kicking or metaphorically, you know, you know like you, ah, you rage against the machine. Um, but where instead you're, there's an objective that is completely independent, that is completely separate. And that's what you want. So the same idea of like using a minimal effort to get what you want, which is the state of not fighting, uh, is a one way of thinking about how the brain just like latches onto the problem as opposed to the solution. And, and similarly, the other thing is like, I remember one of the things, what you were saying about uh, intercepting an attack is, you know, when practicing this stuff, it becomes very uncomfortable because you have like these projectiles flying at you. Um, and one of the things I remember in our training was that, you know, like I would deflect a punch or deflect a, a slap or something, and I would try and get it really far away, you know, like get it out of my sight. And there was something there which was, yeah, you don't need it to be, like you, you don't have to think about how far away it is. You just have to think about it's not where you don't want it. Um, so it's like, it's you. it missed your face by a millimeter, but it missed your face. Don't worry about it, you know? Um, there's an old expression in boxing, make them miss, make them pay. But there's a big difference between making you miss by three feet or making you miss by a centimeter. Because if you're close enough where you didn't hit me, but I can now touch you and I can touch other things, that connection may be what I want. It's not always about the separation. Like I said in the beginning, it's about controlling that distance. But then it's about taking the space away and being able to use every surface area and gravity and some of those leverage can the more surface area the better so i really don't want a bunch of space where there's a lot of possibilities i want to be able to learn to disrupt and take those things away and that's mm -hmm. that that's a different strategy or mentality altogether most people and you always fall back on your training some people still train punches and kick kicks till they till they're a fossil you know but my goal is to do less and not more and at the end of the day i'm really not trying to hurt anybody i want to be mm -hmm. able to uh to uh to connect with them and almost be like a fire blanket take the take that mm. that that poison that fire and that even the punch being fire and energy to be able to dissolve mm. that and dissolve and blend with it and and realize that um i wish more of our law enforcement and a lot of other people had more training around this uh arena and aren't so quick to pull a, a firearm mm. because they can fall back on their training where again it's not necessarily about breaking mm. beating someone up but learning how to break down the structure because weaknesses of the human body are, are very, very real. As you and I explored, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one touch gets a very big response. So it's mm -hmm. not always about, a, it doesn't take, it doesn't take a punch or it doesn't take a hit to get, it actually, it may do more harm than good when it comes to your objective of getting what you want. You know what I'm saying? My mm -hmm. finger may be just enough to do what I need to do to get you to move into a way that I can now uh, control the situation with less effort. Mm -hmm. Again. No, it's it, it's so fascinating, and and one of the things that definitely did strike me is that you need the reps. Like some of this stuff, like you can understand conceptually, but it, I mean, it's a whole other thing when you're dodging something. Um, and and there was one more that I wanted to touch on before talking about um, like your martial arts lineage a bit more, which I think is super interesting and like, uh, and I think just fascinating. But the the other skill I wanted to talk about was sensitivity. Uh, and it's maybe the skill that I've refined the most since, since, you know, I stopped practicing, um, and, and just realizing the wealth of information and input and output that exists in a tiny surface area, um, that sort of has been completely changing my perception of, of the world, um, and I remember you were you would bring it up at a point where I, I you know understood it intellectually, but I had no idea what it meant at a more profound level. Now I'm starting to see it. Um, why don't we talk about sensitivity a bit more? I think it's the, one of the most underrated attributes to work on and develop. Certain attributes, you have all kinds of attributes: speed, strength, coordination, timing, balance, mind familiarization, um, but uh, stamina. There's all there's a whole bunch. Um, but there are some attributes you can work on that, that eventually over time will slowly diminish just based off of the physiology of the human anatomy. Okay. So speed and strength, they're attributes that exist. And I, and I think you should work on them and understand how to reach your highest level of work on your tendon, bone, muscle, strength, all those things, flexibility, um, work on your speed because your initiation and performance of an action and all those things that you can do and your ability to respond is very important to work the nervous system and your ability. But those attributes, if you count on them as your end-all be-all, 
Hmm. Eventually, let me say, there's always a bigger, stronger, faster person. But if you count on that as your end all be all, those, de- those attributes will diminish over time. So you, you know, but there are certain attributes you can work on until you're a fossil, until you, until your la- very last breath and you can work on. So timing, footwork, sensitivity being the one, hmm. um, one of the most important ones. Those things trump other things because even if I'm the more I do, the more I'm not feeling what the other person's doing, and the more I work on my sensitivity, it gives me the ability to respond and to counter and to blend. And if I'm only doing what I want to do, I may miss a whole bunch of other things, and I can be outpowered, or someone else can feel me. So sensitivity is this this uh, under understood, under understood, under understood mm-hmm. attribute. You know that uh, that I've had the 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 blessing and luxury to work with such a um, a high level master who's, I say at the, at the, at the highest peak of that game of sensitivity and the mm-hmm. art of small circle do trap boxing that we'll explore into later is really mm-hmm. about understanding sensitivity at the subtlest level of the finger and the connection of every little touch, every little nook and cranny, exploring the human body as it feels on the way in and every technique on the way in and on the way out. When I move, where do you move? When I step, where do you step? If we're connected, what is that movement? What is that relaxation? What is that energetic wavelength and vibration that we can can uh, understand and play with? It all comes down, down to frequencies, vibrations, and, 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 and energy at the end of the day. All we are is energy, and all this is is time and space mm-hmm. and physics, physical space and dimension. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, the more you can work at your ability to feel energy and to respond and connect to energy, that's what we're doing here. So it's not always about just bludgeoning. I, and again, to connect with somebody, <laughs> to feel their intention, to be able to take it and to freeze you in space and time where you can't move, that's a different, this totally different experience that people haven't experienced, but I have. And we'll talk more about that as we break down the lineage of, <laughs> of that. But sensitivity, like I said, uh, strength can be used against you. I know you people hear all the time, but in Tai Chi, they say one ounce can move a thousand pounds. So it's all about direction and where you're strong and where you're weak. If I can feel where your strength is, I can touch you where you're not strong. And all of a sudden, I can disrupt your balance. So you can, your strength can be used against you. You push too hard, I pull, I open the door, and you fall. Or you pull, I push, I take your balance, and I steal time from you. So understanding that strength can be used against you. And it's not, not that it doesn't exist. It does exist. But to use it unwisely and to be efficient with it and to understand that some strength can be trumped by uh, body weight, leverage, and economy of motion. You know what I mean? And taking someone's strength away because of energy and there's energy leakage. You can disrupt somebody when someone's maybe they're strong and they're trying to choke your neck. And all of a sudden, I tuck my chin, I turn, and I poke you in the throat. You were thinking about me. You're like, oh, I want to choke this guy. I want to break him. I want to hurt him. And all of a sudden, when I poke you in the throat, you're like, oh my goodness, you're thinking about me. You're like, oh, I experienced pain. Now your whole thought process of like, oh, I really want to hurt this person is now on yourself thinking, you're thinking about yourself now. So a distraction of the mind can disrupt someone's output of strength so quickly. We move at the speed mm. of thought and we respond to pain like touching a touching your hand on a stove. Ha! You're going to respond. And I want to be able to take advantage of weaknesses of the human body and reflex of humans and play with the reflexes through understanding defense and connection. That's different than mm-hmm. training punches and kicks. Now you have to understand how to blend with punches and kicks. And you have to understand a punch and a kick, but you don't have to, like I always tell people, you have to be able to understand and possibly speak the language of violence, but I want to. I have mm-hmm. to understand the language of violence, even if I don't want to be a violent person. I have to understand mm. crazy, and then then I can understand and how to communicate with that and deal with that. With but I don't necessarily have to speak the language of violence, but I have to understand and how to. Sp- I have to be able to understand it. And does that make sense? And if I no totally. So. So in that, um, go ahead, please. No, no, no. It, it, it's and it's. And now what you mentioned about, you know, this, this, you know, serving you till old age, I hadn't even begun to think about, you know, the, the, there's this implicit idea, I think we have in the modern mind that after you start aging to a certain degree, your life, you know, like all of the things that define you sort of start going away. Um, Whereas if you have this dimension that you can constantly grow that is only dependent on your experience and only dependent on your ability to internalize concepts, um, then you can have even more influence and more impact and more, you know, sort of, uh, you know, you, the leverage that you have over the community and the people around you and the tools around you um, is it only grows. Um, I think of like, you know, in a, in an, in an, 
in an ancient setting, you know, the, the elders of the town would be the people who could read you in an instant, you know, um, the wise elders and the, the great masters. Um, and, and it's just fascinating to explore. And it's, it's one thing to think about it intellectually. It's another thing entirely to practice uh, interpersonally. Um, and, okay, and then the, the follow-up question to that is um, a brief history of the practice lineage that, you, that you've that you incorporated throughout the years. Uh, but I see you waving your fingers. So if you want to add something no, before, let's I do it. I just want to add in. I just want to say that just to reiterate that what you're talking about, it's a, everything I, I, I try to practice on are, are like is a lifetime development, right? Um, Kung Fu is life and life is Kung Fu. And what I mean by that, Kung Fu doesn't mean like some martial practice. Kung Fu means hard work, long time. Hard work, long mm. time. So whatever you devote your life to, whatever, it could be, you could be a master chef and that would be your Kung Fu. Same thing. Jeet Kune Do is this mm. highest level, is the, is, is the highest level of human expression. You're reaching your highest level. Bruce Lee didn't want it to be some new martial art. It was just a boat. It's like a, a boat to help you get across the river. Once you got across the river, you're not supposed to carry that boat with you. You throw the boat away. You don't need a boat. You're going to you cross the river already. So my point is, it's just the name. In that name, but mm. what the concept of Jeet Kune Do is, is to reach your highest level, to be in the, the optimum performance, to be in the, the, the highest vibrating state, and to be present here and now, and to be able to adapt to any situation, because the only constant in life is change, right? And understanding that is how do we adapt, and how do we be happy, and how do we prepare ourselves to blend and adapt in the most, well, we have to learn to relax, and we have to learn to breathe, because mm. if you don't do those, you're not you know what I mean so again going back down mm -hmm. to the breath understanding ourselves taking time to explore ourselves and to, to get to know ourselves that's what martial arts is because to me mm. uh, we talk about real fears a tiger chasing you there's no scarier animal than five or six human beings with weapons in a back alley trying to, to destroy you or take mm. your life that's pretty scary stuff and that's a reality so my point is the fact mm. that that can happen as, as an intelligent apex predator we humans can be if we want to be um we have to be able to weaponize our awareness so we can respond to anything. So I need to be prepared mm. for that. Just like I need to be prepared to be able mm. to pull myself, do a pull up or run fast to get away from that tsunami. You know, my brother always told me, you do not, um, you're not supposed to run from a bear, but he told me you just can't, you can't be the slowest one. And that's a bad joke. But at the same time, <laughs> you really want to train, even though I don't love to run. I don't love to run, but I train to run. I don't love to sprint, but I sprint if I need to. So I train and keep the ability to, even though I don't love to pound the pavement, I'd much rather get on my bike and go 20 miles an hour than 7 to 7 or 12 or whatever for a sort. You know what I'm saying? Energy conservation at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, going back to the lineage, um, I've had the mm – -hmm. the, uh, if you have any questions, I mean, I can, we can elaborate upon that. I didn't mean to jump ship on you. You were just asking me. So I realized I kind of took us down a different tangent. Um, I'm here for it. Let's go. I, start, I started down martial arts. Um, I started martial arts at a young age in Kempo, Karate, and Kempo, which is a form of karate and kung fu at a young age with my brother. Both of my, my, brother, both of my brothers indoctrinated me into the kung fu and martial lifestyle. Our, our oldest brother, James, he's eight years older than me, he, uh, he had a, a proclivity for making kung fu weapons nunchuck, ooh, throwing mm. knives and speakers, all the staffs, all the things that we had. So we grew up. He exposed us to all the cool things. He broke us into the b-boy culture of breakdancing, graffiti, and art, and, and martial arts, and gung fu, and, and R&B, and hip-hop, and soul music. So he kind of incorporates and got us to follow down that road. But my brother, Chad, who's two years older than me, my first real uh, karate teacher, as, he, as we aged, he continued to really be the one to excel in martial arts. He stuck with the karate longer than I did. We joined uh, Aikido. We did Taekwondo, we studied in different arts, and he, throughout college, continued to compete and train in karate and Taekwondo. And uh, I just, I, I loved that, I loved the martial arts, but I just trained enough to make sure that when my brother wanted to beat my butt, I could play a little defense and not get my tail handed me too bad, even though he did hurt me sometimes. Mm -hmm. My point is, um, he was my first Kung Fu and boxing and karate coach after after my mm -hmm. young childhood masters and teachings. And then back in, uh, mm -hmm. in 2000, and, the year 2000, I came out to California. I ended up having uh, some pretty bad carpal tunnel from repetitive stress injury mm. from working in the in the movie theater business and doing too, crimping and twisting too many things with my hands. And came out to California and I started doing some Wing Chun to try to work on lengthening and, and, and moving my wrist and getting some more mobility back into the, mm. 
the uh, strengthening the eccentric loading of the muscle and lengthening of the muscle. Um, I found mm -hmm. it to be very helpful with the carpal tunnel. And I was exposed at the time by my cousin who had some Jeet Kune Do tapes uh, of, a, of a master in Southern California who had trained the Navy SEALs and had a combative form of mm -hmm. Jeet Kune Do that he had offered to government agencies. And he had some pretty, uh, really um, intense training videos that I found to be very powerful and mm -hmm. it really opened my eyes. So I had the, the luxury in 2004 to go meet him and train with him. And, mm -hmm. and my brother and I went on to, to a intensive training um, um, seminar with him and then a private seminar and then a ITPT and then came back in 2010 and re reconnected. I was in IT for a while, had a, had a, had some stuff happen to me where I, I, uh, mm. my life changed and I pivoted and was able to switch into martial arts mm. full time. So then I went down mm. 2010, really from that moment on 2010 dedicated the risk. And I was already teaching in 2004, some Jeet Kune Do privately here in San Francisco. But in 2010, mm -hmm. I went full time, started training full time and uh, opened up my own school, brick and mortar in 2012 mm -hmm. and been teaching here in San Francisco ever since. And, and having a chance to train with, you know, Sifu Paul Vunak, which exposed me to meet Sifu Harinder Singh Sabarwal, which exposed me to meet Grandmaster Professor James Hunden, who I had to travel thousands of miles to go to a seminar in Southern California to meet my master, my master now mm. who lives five miles or, you know, now 20 miles, but at the time five miles away from me um, here in San Francisco. <laughs> so James Hunden, uh, small circle Jew trap boxing. He has an organization called universal martial arts Academy and his art is mm -hmm. small circle Jew trap boxing, which is a culmination mm -hmm. of all experience and training in the martial arts over the last 55, 60 years and 35 years underneath Grand Grandmaster Wally J of Small Circle Jiu-Jitsu, eight years with Dr. Moses Powell and some of these other masters, great masters, Loki Little John, Professor Crossan on the East Coast, and had a chance to train with some original Jun Feng Gong Fu students and some other Filipino masters. My teacher has so much uh, wisdom, and both of my teachers, mm -hmm. I've been I've been blessed to have a, have a lot of good teachers in my, you know, share their wisdom and their humility and their, their lessons with me, and I've been, you know, I'm a proud and humble student of the masters who come before me. You know, but and, and, it's, last, and, 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 and this whole this whole uh, segment of the interview, I think, is is highly important and worth talking about because the way I don't think there's enough uh, mainstream knowledge of how these teachings are passed and how these uh, teachings are evaluated against each other and the community around them and like this beautiful sophistication and reverence toward the effort that the the ones that came before uh sort of had to search for and like the spaces and the battles quite literally that they had to you know um go through to blood, pass on this tears. knowledge blood sweat and tears <laughs> Blood, sweat, and tears, quite literally, and you know, from the actual history of war to the sort of uh, the modern, you know, uh, distributed uh, research enterprise that is, you know, uh, what is the way of the warrior that ends with peace, um, and the community that's built around that, and um, it, it is beautiful. And and I want to note one thing that I don't think most people know. people are familiar with the cartoon version of martial arts, like the kung fu. You know, you practice forms all day. There's like a questionable association with like the real world and how that maps to the streets. Um, and it's very sort of like um, uh, like a caricature of the world of martial arts. Whereas, um, you know, and, you know, to some degree, that's what it used to be. Like, you know, like I think of an ancient Shaolin temple, you know, like it's this, you know, this very like almost fantasy land imagination of what you know what that training looked like and you know doing the forms for thousands of times a day um to a more modern version of that um that is bruce lee and him thinking of okay but what does this mean in the actual world and him as a performer like he was an actor more than more than um uh you know a, a competitor in martial arts um and uh, and then him sort of bringing this, I think, very unique perspective that, and I think it forms a lot of thought that has come since, that is this meta martial art, right? Like it's very intensely sort of trying to redefine what martial arts are and saying like, keep what you, what is useful, discard what is not. And, you know, you're always self-aware and reasoning through, um, you know, the tools that you have available and how often you are getting in your own way. Um, 
And I thought that, you know, Jeet Kune Do was revelatory for those reasons. Um, and then there's a lineage of, you know, Bruce Lee himself, you know, packaging it into a set of things. This is what Jeet Kune Do is. And then teaching it to his students. And then that's exactly how the torch sort of like gets passed around. And that's how you got it. Um, mm -hmm. And then every master incorporates their own learnings you know like they it's phd level and then they they reach the highest levels of the mountain uh and then you know like they say no less is more or you know like or they they develop a refinement that you sort of can't get to until you've seen the mountaintop um and Absolutely. so i wanted to talk about something like small uh dew trap <laughs> boxing small circle dew trap boxing because mm -hmm. It's somewhat esoteric, like most people probably have never heard about it, but I think it's like when having, having seen it in action through you and like having experienced the pain of the finger traps and, and, and whatnot, like I think it just is, is something worth highlighting as, as, a, as a, you know, an incredible innovation and um, just like the, the fact that this is a living, breathing thing, that this, this flame is still expanding today, that it's growing, that like the, the, the research uh, project is still happening. Um, so why don't we talk about a little bit about small circle, Jew trap boxing and, you know, how it looks so that people have an idea of what the, the vibe of it is when it compares to these other caricaturesque forms that they may have of karate or kung fu and how this is so different. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. So let's see. I'm just saying you, I had a lot of different talking points, so I don't know where I want to start. Um, Go take well, it wherever you want. Yeah. Well, in today's day and age, you can find you can find all various, you know, types of training still occurring today. Some traditional in the class, uh, you know, working on kata and forms and some, you know, every art still some some traditional schools still fall by similar playbooks on on how certain things are disseminated. I mean, as far as the way they teach. Uh, for, for me and for the Jeet Kune Do, Dan Inosanto was one of Bruce Lee's top students. He was a training partner and best friend. And he, there are different mm -hmm. branches of the Jeet Kune Do tree, depending on which student of yours, or which original Jun Fang Gung Fu student you are training under, you may get a different level of lessons based off of where they were at in their training and what they learned from Bruce. Just like me, I mm. teach my students, I meet them where they're at. So if you train with one of my students, you may get some information and you may get some more, sorry, some more information from another one of my students who has gone down mm. a different, deeper, dark, deeper hole, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'm very blessed to be a part of the Inosanto branch, I believe, because he was Bruce Lee's mm. training partner and best friend. He, he, I believe the mantle and the torch of Jeet Kune Do was kind of left on his shoulders when Bruce went to go mm -hmm. teach in, I mean, to go do uh, Holly, I mean, in Hong Kong to work on movies, he left the school open with Bruce Lee and I mean with Dan and Asanto in LA, and and he continued to evolve into teaching just like all masters, like you just brought up my teacher in small circle trap boxing. <laughs> you train for a lifetime and you learn from various masters, and you may put twenty years here and ten years there in different systems, and you've learned all this information, and it doesn't all fit into one cup. And for me, mm. like I always I always joke, you're not going to see me. 20 down years down the road with Tim Kwando or some crazy shit. Excuse my language. <laughs> pardon my language. Um, <laughs> uh, but I'm just going to give credit because, like I said, Jeet Kune Do is a name. It's a boat to get me across the river. For me, I teach self-defense. Mm -hmm. I train my all these different arts. Small mm -hmm. school boxing is real because it's the it's the culmination and the evolution of all of these arts that my teacher has been studied in. Um, and even just like Jeet Kune Do or even small circle, uh, small circle jujitsu comes from Kodenkan jujitsu, which his teacher, Danzen Ryu, Danzen Ryu Kodenkan, well, before that, it was a different, his teacher had a different martial art altogether. Mm. Because it, like you said, you have 70, 60, 50 years of martial arts experience and at the end of the, your lifetime, you've evolved, you've added, you've subtracted, you've, you've changed some things. So sometimes um, over the course of time, there is an evolution and there's always an evolution. And that's what Jeet Kune Do is about is to absorb what is useful, reject what is useless and add what is specifically your, your you know, relevant to you or to your own. And that works for you because something that works for you may not work for me. You and I have different levers mm -hmm. of our arms. We have different heights and different torsion sizes, different attributes that we can exploit or take advantage of. So we have to get to know ourselves. So your Jeet Kune Do may be slightly different when it comes to application and, and capabilities or possibilities. Does that make sense? So I may, so, um, so the question, going back to um, the evolution, 
what was the, can I help me drill down? What was going on? Oh yeah. Well, what a, paint a picture of, of small circle do trap boxing so that people have an, a, 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 can contrast the difference between what that looks like versus something like karate. Oh, okay. Well, let's just say any art form, most art forms originally came from, like you said, some type of war, some type of weaponized. If you look at the statistics on a fight, a real street fight, there is so seldom a one-on-one -on -one fight between two people. If you look at the statistics, mm -hmm. it's almost always a one on two on one, a three on one. And usually there's a weapon that comes out in a real street fight. So mm -hmm. it's not a you put them up, you know, you dishonor me, take out my glove and slap you. and We're going to duel type mm -hmm. of thing anymore. And you know what I mean? So my point mm -hmm. is to be able to adapt to the reality of the street situation is to be able to understand how do I deal with weapons and how do I deal with mass attack? Mm -hmm. And that goes back to martial arts at its core, because whether you're talking about the samurai warrior or the Filipino artist who's using the stick and the knife, we train with the weapon and the weapon, the weapon training correlates to the empty hands directly. So if I'm using a samurai mm -hmm. sword, for instance, that same motion is a finger lock when I come down or an arm bar as I drop my weight and move. The movement patterns mm -hmm. and the techniques are the same. It's just now the application is slightly different because I don't have a sword in my hand, but I'm still arm barring you and shifting and dropping my weight to the exact same movement patterns. So some mm -hmm. movement patterns would be a lock. As I step back with my sword, that could be me locking you into a number five or a vertical tower. So um, at the end of the day, there's a difference between, I'll just break it down, karate and some of these other arts. There's a striking arts that work on punches and kicks. And there are some other arts like Aikido that work on blending with some strikes and punches and go into some type of joint locking to manipulate and move somebody where you want them to go or to isolate their movements. The joint can either mm -hmm. be completely compressed or completely mm -hmm. extended. And when the joint, like an alligator's mouth, is completely shut, he has no strength mm -hmm. to open it. When my arm is completely hyperextended and, and vulnerable, it exposes all the ligaments, nerves, and the vulnerabilities of the joint. So by taking mm -hmm. advantage of some of the leverage, and it doesn't mean that jujitsu and some of these arts don't still have striking, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to some arts are more pure. Aikido doesn't do a lot of strikings. They, they respond mm -hmm. to a strike, but they like to spin and move and, and blend and go right into the throw or a lock or this usually some type of... Uh, deflection right mm -hmm. and to blend with the, the well we've taken that same principle but small circle jew trap boxing as it expands the small circle small circle jujitsu which is usually on the end so let's go mm -hmm. back to the middle which is trapping and let's go back to the first part which is boxing so if you mm -hmm. do it, it did it in reverse we have to understand the boxing if someone's throwing a punch or kick at my head how do i blend with that boxing through boxing defense how do i maybe mm -hmm. trap their hands and touch their face and get a response. And then how do I lock them out and take the fight away? So in Jew trap boxing, it's really about intercepting someone's attack, capturing their, their with, through defense, taking their weapons away, mm -hmm. and, then, and then now controlling them through joint manipulation, small joint manipulation. I always say the, mm -hmm. the strategy of small school trap boxing is to, uh, if someone attacks me, I want to be able to upset their balance and vision, disrupt their mm -hmm. uh, equilibrium, cause pain and attack joints uh, all in all in the first one to three beats of the of them attacking me so understanding a little bit about defense and how to move right not to necessarily uh trading blows if you watch two dogs fight they go right after each other you watch two cats fight mm -hmm. it's something totally different but if you watch a cat and a dog mm -hmm. fight the cat doesn't sit there and try to fight the dog so i'm not going to sit there and try to fight someone's strengths because you got at the end of the day i'm not trying to compete I'm not competing, I'm cheating. And I don't need to punch you in the face to move a little bit with a little defense and touch you and let you run into something. And as you're over responding to that, take that, what you've given me. So it's a very, um, I don't know how to say. It's a gentle, but a violently gentle art. And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. in the softness, if you ever play rock, paper, scissors, mm -hmm. you play rock, paper, scissors before? Yeah, paper, I have, rock, yes. Paper, Right. So I want you to see that mm. softness can beat hardness. And even if you look at water, like who says water can be soft, but water can crash. So I want to understand mm -hmm. and the attribute of me understanding how to blend like water. It's not always about the crash. Sometimes it's about the softness that leads to the crash. So it's, it's about how to play with time and how to, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, at the highest level. It's, it's a, it's, it's very intellectual. It's not trading blows with your opponent. It's, mm -hmm. it's how it's, Allowing your opponent to put their weaknesses on your leverage points and then do less. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I'm do less through understanding movement and understanding weaknesses of the human body and the anatomy better mm -hmm. than the other person who's dealing with. There's a saying, you got to know your opponent better than they know themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And there's also another thing.
you know, you know your opponent and you know yourself, you're almost guaranteed victory. You don't know your opponent, you don't know yourself, you're almost guaranteed defeat. If you only know, if you only know your opponent or only know yourself, you got a 50-50 chance. So my goal is mm -hmm. to know myself, know my opponent better than he knows himself. That means I know your balance better than you know it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We touch, I know exactly mm -hmm. where your balance is. So uh, I want to know your intentions. I want to know what your likes and dislikes are. What, you know, what, what kind of Netflix movies do you like? Does he like ice cream? Mm -hmm. No, my point, I'm not going that far. Mm -hmm. But my point is if, if I raise my hand and you don't raise your hand, I know you don't raise your hand. If I drop my head and I drop my weight and you don't drop, I know you're not going to drop. So I can start to probe mm -hmm. and play in space and time to discover what you do and don't mm -hmm. like, what patterns you do and don't like, and then take advantage of your lack of response or your over response, which goes back to hand immobilization, which goes back to progressive indirect attacking and understanding defense as the best, best form of offense. Because again, mm -hmm. doing less, if you want to come to me and throw a punch at me, bam, you're right there. I can take it away. It's not, I don't have to come to you and use my, use my attributes. I don't have to even show you speed. What mm -hmm. beats speed? I always tell my students, what's mm -hmm. faster mm -hmm. than moving fast? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a question. I know the answer. I know the answer, you told, you told you, 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 I know the I know answer the already. already. Uh, uh, timing. Not, moving, not, moving, not, even, not moving at all, being in the right place. So if I don't move and you run right. into something, I move my body, but my right there, you may run into a hand that was already there, but you're so busy thinking it's about speed that you, you lost track of space and time. So I'm going to mm -hmm. be this like, you know, uh, Bruce Lee always says, you know, when, when moving, Hold on, go ahead, please. Uh, uh no, no, no. That it, it's, it, it is just like it's so interesting because like with the, the the visual that I have seared in my brain is like the the efficiency of a finger trap, and you know like uh, if you if you're in a position where you actually have somebody grab one of your fingers and you feel like you know that it's about to come off, um, you you surrender all kind of it, it's this really like hack for the brain where like you, you it's very humiliating because something so simple has you so cornered and you're so vulnerable and like completely surrendered um and i i thought this uh you know small circle of trap boxing was the art of finding those so you're gonna say i was gonna say um great grandmaster wally j professor's teacher says is one of his famous lines is pain makes believers so once you experience the pain of a finger lock done properly so remember we're not trying to break your finger i'm not i want this person who tried to hurt me on the verge of thinking their finger is going to break because they're experiencing this pain but i'm not breaking their finger that's where the sensitivity and control comes in and by basing out and people will get it twisted i'm not just finger locking you I've broken your structure down. I'm stretching your head out. I have my mm -hmm. thumb in your neck as I'm finger locking you. So I'm giving you pain like in three or four different places. And then it's mm -hmm. almost like a, having electric shock on somebody where you can control their movements and their responses. But at the same time, I'm not having to hit you. But it's too much. It's overwhelming for the nervous system. It's You're right. so it's overwhelming. overwhelming. Pain makes you freak out. And then when you're doing a pain response compliant technique on somebody, if you don't tell them what to do, like you're on the ground and I'm doing something that make and I want you to get up and walk, but I'm putting all this pain on you, you'll freeze. <laughs> I have to talk you through up, 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 and do the pain as I'm telling you what to do and guide you towards the pain to move to the to the process of standing up or sitting down. Because when you're experiencing a certain amount of pain, mm. your body goes and, and hey jack uh, freezes in, in like, almost like electric shock. And that's the mastery. Mm -hmm. It's different than punches and kicks. And until people experience it, and the, the, the difference is, and no, no knocking anything, that um, there's always an evolution. And that's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. So small circle, ju ju small circle jiu jitsu is an amazing compliance and locking technique and, and art form. But depending on where you learn it, if you learn it from certain people of the, of the, who mm -hmm. are doing things the old way or who are doing things in a way have, who haven't evolved, they may not understand. That they a lot of times in the old let's just explain in the old dojo they did a lot of things out of a grab out of a push mm -hmm. out of a grab or a push or some kind of automatic some type of response but not a live uh, MMA street type of wild angles and the live type of attack so over the last what is it forty years my teacher has been blending this small circle jiu trap boxing with I mean the small circle with the jeet kune do and the kickboxing and the boxing and understanding. How do I get to this lock? How do mm, I get this mm -hmm. person after they attack me or I attack them, depending on the scenario? Again, like I said, force continue. I mean, uh, the engagement. Do I attack them or do they attack me or do we clash? 
You know, I would rather them mm-hmm. attack me so I can counterattack. It. But I may have to engage. But again, or we may clash. But again, I would like to just say the engagement is one aspect. But how do I get this person who's we're engaging with to over respond and they put the damn lock in my hand like they move? I trap them <laughs> face. I, I hand them. I trap their hand. I backhand them and they cover it. I take their lock and I take them to the floor because their hand came up and now I'm trapping their arm and their finger. So I'm just saying we train in our system um drills and we do a lot of stuff in drills to increase muscle memory and ease of use from lock flows Mm. to trapping hitting going into locking to intercepting something and then going right into the lock you train these patterns over and over again the possibilities of blending with the hook blending with the jab blending with the cross intercepting the kick and moving offline and touching somebody you do those things over over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and all of a sudden they become as an auto response. When this guy throws a punch, I move, I move my head, I stick my hand out. He runs right into mm-hmm. that. He, I cradle my arm. He's right into my arm. I can turn and take him to the floor because he's right in my bread basket. You, if you watch like a, I always, the analogy of nature is really good. If mm-hmm. you look at a spider, they create a spider whip. You don't see spiders flying in the, on a string on their tail and then grabbing bugs out of the air like a freaking, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? They just create a web and they sit back and wait. So that's that Jew trap mentality. So when this bug lands in this hornet, lands in the spider web's nest, the spider's over here and he feels it. He's like, he's connected to the mm-hmm. thing that you're stuck on. He can walk over. He's This other thing's trying to attack him, but he's connected to the thing you're trapped to. He can spin you, wrap you up, and eat you for later if he wants to. Mm-hmm. But my point is, he's not he's not working very hard. That's the efficiency. If someone's attacking and they run into my defense, the offense is automatic. I don't have to think about hitting you. You run into a bunch of stuff, and I don't have to even – guess where it's at i don't have to guess where you are i know exactly where you are with my eyes closed because we've developed that hand sensitivity and total body sensitivity of movement awareness of self and awareness of our opponent and connection to our opponent so those things are taught in drills to make it ease of use so you don't think about it so you can flow you can connect everything's about desensitizing your responses your flinch reflex for instance we talked about it you said it's very Mm. awkward to have things (laughs) in your head if i just put my hands near your face it's already a weird thing for you so in the beginning if i touch your forehead you'll blink but I can hit myself in the head and not blink. So I don't blink mm-hmm. because I'm trained myself to watch something coming at my head and not blink, even if it touches me. So we have to mm-hmm. desensitize certain reflexes so that when they happen, that we can respond the way we want to, not the way that we're programmed to by our biology. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. We have to override our biology. Like I said, our biology says tense up, even to protect ourselves. If I go into a seizure, my body tenses up. So when I hit the ground, my head doesn't smack off the ground. But that's not always the best mm. thing. Because as you know, in a car crash, if you're tense, you could hurt yourself. But the guy who's mm. drunk in the car accident, he's sometimes the guy who doesn't get hurt at all because he's just flowing mm. with it effortlessly. So my point is we have to mm. train our bodies to relax. We have to train our nervous system to relax. And that is a skill, like a muscle that has to be developed. And if you don't do it, it's not going to just happen magically when you need it. You know. But again, mm. small screw trap is about developing the sensitivity. How do I get into a place where the lock mm. is automatic? There, if you are aware of the human anatomy, wherever you are, you're somewhere. You're never lost, right? You're always somewhere. Mm-hmm. You may not know where you are, but my point is, in if you understand exactly where you are, are all the time, and then you realize there's always a possibility or potential, especially to counter mm-hmm. or to connect or to, to blend, my goal is not to hurt you. My goal is to blend with your attack or to blend with your movements, mm-hmm. just like a dance partner. When you want to, mm-hmm. I, I can't step on your, I can't step, if you were my dance partner, Christian, Chris, I, can, I, mm-hmm. couldn't, I couldn't step on your toes, I couldn't step on your toes mm-hmm. very long, or you would my dance partner. So I got to be aware mm-hmm. of myself, aware I face in time. So when I move and I mm-hmm. blend with your movements that I don't collide and bump a knee or step on your foot and we trip over or something like that. Same thing is true in this thing. I've got to know exactly where your feet are, where your knee is, where my, so I can avoid head on collisions so I can blend perfectly. But again, this is a lifetime skill. And the better you are mm-hmm. at understanding yourself, the more effortlessly you can adapt to situations. But if you start when you're If you never do it, it's not going to be easy. If you start when it's Mm -hmm. later, just like the piano, it's going to be harder, but that's not, it's never too late. The human body, we are, (laughs) let me close with this one thing I want to say is we create our own reality. That's the hidden (laughs) truth that people don't. Mm -hmm. Does that Mm -hmm. make sense? Mm -hmm. My teacher, he always is neuroplasticity and always putting the white belt is real. He started playing the harmonica less than six years ago. He's got a professional band. He's playing live music and he sounds like he's been playing his whole lifetime. So with the right amount of dedication mm-hmm. and the right attitude and the right spirit, you can learn something new and you can, you can grow and you can change and you can evolve and it's never too late. Mm-hmm.
And that's a beautiful way to end it. Thank you so much for the time. This has been amazing, Sifu Tim. I'm excited to keep chatting with you and just keep developing this relationship. I, I uh, 